A Facebook whistleblower has told US lawmakers that she believes Facebook's products harm children, stoke division and weaken democracy. Frances Haugen has been telling a Senate hearing that Facebook's leaders know how to make their products safer, but won't because they've put their astronomical profits before people. She said that as long as Facebook is operating in the shadows and hiding its research from public scrutiny, it is unaccountable, and she called on the authorities to take action. This just a day after a global outage prevented access to Facebook and its sister sites, WhatsApp and Instagram, for several hours. Billions of people were affected, showing just how dependent the world has become on a company that's under intense scrutiny. Let's have a listen to some of Frances Haugen's opening statement. I'm here today because I believe Facebook's products harm children, stoke division, and weaken our democracy. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. Congressional action is needed. They won't solve this crisis without your help. Yesterday, we saw Facebook get taken off the internet. I don't know why I went down, but I know that for more than five hours, Facebook wasn't used to deepen divides, destabilize democracies, and make young girls and women feel bad about their bodies. Well, Frances Haugen said harmful, divisive online content is because Facebook prioritizes profit. It is about Facebook choosing to grow at all costs, becoming an almost trillion dollar company by buying its profits with our safety. During my time at Facebook, I came to realize a devastating truth. Almost no one outside of Facebook knows what happens inside of Facebook. The company intentionally hides vital information from the public, from the US government, and from governments around the world. Our correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue, has been listening to the hearing in Washington uh, and joins us live from there. Um, Gary, quite unusual for us to get this kind of level of insider information uh, so publicly. Yes, um, I mean, Frances Haugen is not just a, a whistleblower. She's a whistleblower with a, a couple of boxfuls of documents and research which she took from the company when she left. So uh, that is something that gives her a great deal more credibility and backs up some of the claims she's been making about the nature of the research Facebook itself conducts on the impact on, particularly on people like teenage girls of Instagram and and how that can reinforce some negative views of themselves. So this is being taken very seriously, not just because she's very credible, but because of that sheer weight of documentation that we've been seeing um, set out in the um, Wall Street Journal in, in recent weeks. And it's interesting, one of the things that struck me uh, from what we've heard so far, Gary, was how direct she was in her criticism of specific individuals. I mean, she, she named Mark Zuckerberg the uh, founder and head of Facebook and said that he wields so much power and yet in her view is unaccountable. Yeah, I mean Mark Zuckerberg is the majority shareholder of course in Facebook. It's floated but it's, uh, you know, he owns, you know, he's controlling a share of the, the votes on the board. So in a sense what he, what he wants goes. Uh, she was quite critical about some things that he could have stopped and didn't stop, she said, in particular to misinformation in, in languages that aren't English. So she mentioned uh, Ethiopia in particular, also talked about um, Myanmar, uh, and really pointed out something that I think is quite interesting, particularly for people watching this around the world, is that she said something like 80 odd percent of the, of the money that's spent inside Facebook on trying to track down hate speech and that sort of thing is spent on the English language material which is only around 9% of what appears on things like Facebook and, and Instagram. So you can see that the resources go into English but actually there's a, a sort of open goal when it comes to the hundreds and hundreds of other languages around the world where uh, this kind of material can be propagated. Gary, we've seen similar hearings happen in the not too distant past and yet nothing much seems to have changed. Do you get a sense that this is going to be any different this time? 
Yeah, I mean, that's difficult to tell. I mean, what there is this time uh, is a real sense of kind of bar bipartisan agreement. I mean, some of these people on this committee are normally at one another's throats over everything, and they're not on this occasion. Uh, you've got some, you know, real rivals here, real people who don't see eye to eye on anything, and they're seeing eye to eye on this. And I think that's something that ought to worry Facebook significantly because there are legislative things they could do if they get uh, uh, some impetus inside Congress. Um, Self-regulation, we know the White House doesn't believe self-regulation is working, so you've got some support there. Uh, and if you can get something together in Congress, you really could, uh, you know, do some things or that there are some things that are being suggested here that, that could, could get through quite easily. So I think there's a real potential kind of moment here for platforms like Facebook, in particular the way in which its you know, famous algorithms work and the fact that you don't, well no one really knows how they work, no one knows what the code underlying them does and says and how the, how the if ends up with the then and the, you know, you get from A to B in terms of what gets presented on your story, etc., which is the thing she says, Frances Haugen says, is doing so much damage, not just to teenage girls, but to political discourse, to elections, all sorts of other areas uh, of life. So I think there's, it's potential here, but um, Facebook's a, you know, a trillion dollar company. It's not going to take this lying down, uh, and it hasn't take this, taken this lying down. It's pushed back on a lot of these things, uh, particularly in the political sphere where it says, you know, it didn't invent polarisation. I suppose the question is whether it's magnified polarisation. That's what its critics would say. OK, uh, Gary, for the moment, thank you very much. Gary O'Donoghue there in Washington. And uh, speaking about Facebook pushing back, I should just bring you a line from uh, Facebook's policy communications director, who has said on Twitter he's keen to stress that Haugen is being asked about things she did not directly work on and, in his words, has no direct knowledge of. But uh, we should also point out that, to be fair to Haugen, she has told senators that she didn't work in some of the areas she's being asked about, saying only that she is pretty sure that teenagers are among Facebook's most profitable users. I'm sure there'll be more lines uh, uh, rebuttal from Facebook. Uh, we'll bring those to you and reflect Facebook's uh, response as well. Uh, let's now, though, go to Luana Marquez, who is president of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, joins us live now. What do you make of what you've heard so far? Well, I think I'm really concerned, as I think many of us are. We know that the brain of teenagers is not fully developed, and we keep hearing things again when Lauren said that they want um, to go away from Facebook or Instagram, but they can't. And that's because their brain is not fully developed. So it really is time for um, Congress um, to do something to protect our kids. I mean, with matters of mental health, with depression, issues of self-esteem and self-worth, they are such complex issues. Is it possible to make a, a decisive link between someone's use of Facebook or Instagram, for example, and the resulting, uh, if it is indeed resulting from that, uh, mental health issues? I don't think it's possible to be decisive. I don't think we have data that can really say it's causing it. I think what we know, it's certainly amplifying it. If you're feeling sad and depressed, one of the things that happens most of the time is you start to isolate. But now teenagers are isolating on their phone and their brain is filtering in information that continues to feed their, their depression. And so it becomes a bit of a chicken and an egg kind of situation. But for sure, I think we have significant data suggesting that it's exacerbating symptoms of depression, body image, self-esteem. Is the right answer to this really regulation and more rules, stricter rules, or does it come down to us as the individual users to moderate what we put on there, double check what we share, and think about the impact of what we post and how much we filter it on others? I think both of those things are important. I think the challenge in that argument, though, is that teenagers and young adults don't have the ability to really choose. Their brains, as I said, not fully developed. So then it's put on parents to monitor. And I think certainly um, parents have a responsibility 
to monitor and ensure um, that their kids are limiting the consumption and know what they're consuming. But given the magnitude of this problem, I think it's impossible to solve at the individual level. It's a really a public health concern. And I think we need some legislature, some kind of strategy that allow this to um, be tamed at a global level. I mean, Facebook says it has spent significant sums of money on improving safety. Do you see the evidence of that and uh, the benefits being felt in the field that you work in? Personally, I haven't seen that. Um, I heard the company say that, but what I hear from teenagers that I work with, young adults, inner city kids that I work with, is that they find themselves more and more addicted to Instagram and Facebook, not less. And that certainly has made their mental health concerns worse. Okay, uh, Luana, and uh, just briefly, um, what are you hoping to hear in the testimony um, that would give you some sort of hope? My hope is that we really um, hear strategies to mitigate this and that Congress takes this very serious into the next level. I also hope that more people like um, Lauren come forward and are able to share some of the data so that we have a clear picture of what to do. Okay, Luana Marquez, President of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, thanks for joining us on BBC World News.